So this will haunt you the rest of your life, maybe help you the rest of your life. Depends on how you want to look at it. Hopefully help you. So I'm going to skip this real fast. We'll talk about it on test days. We've already talked about it if you're a senior. A little biology of food and getting sleepy. So here's a bunch of things I'm going to skip through because they're all scattered throughout. I meant to take these off. Again, they're now IB things that are in red or green. Green's the higher level, the additional higher level stuff. Red is for everybody, standard level. So here we go. So we've had some of these terms already. Primary producers, right? They can use photosynthesis or maybe chemosynthesis to produce what? Organic molecules. From what? Inorganic molecules. That's what you or I can't do. That's what makes them an autotroph, self-feeder, make their foods themselves. But again, you and I produce molecules, but we need to start with other ones, organic other ones. And that's why we're called secondary producers, but you won't see us refer to that very often. More normally, we're referred to as consumers. Okay, so most ecosystems rely on a supply of energy from sunlight. Sometimes, though, you have chemistry reactions, like in deep sea vents, providing the energy for the base of the food chain, the autotrophs. Okay, so here we have predict the effects of change. These, again, are AP kind of uh, syllabus uh, objectives, learning objectives, LO. Um, effects of a change in the community's population. A lot of this is common sense, all right? of uh, the effective change of matter or energy available to communities. So here we go, right? Uh, this is called reductionist thinking, that life is a bunch of chemistry and physics, and therefore we can explain it all at its heart in terms of chemistry and physics. Um, so we can trace all the energy from solar output to where it ends up as heat released by organisms, Second law of thermodynamics means we can't even break even. We're going to lose some energy at each conversion. Okay, so here the IB syllabus things um, talk about energy being released when respiration reactions happen. Here we have some glycolysis and stuff like that. It's released as heat and it amounts to lost energy in terms of being able to do work. Not lost to the universe, but being able to do work, right? Why? Because living organisms can't convert heat to other forms of energy. It can keep you warm for a while as it's passing through you, but once it's out of you, nothing else can do work with it. So this is a big kind of diagram that shows an idea that we really uh, emphasized before and will emphasize again, that energy can be exchanged with the surroundings, but not matter in a closed ecosystem. What kind of ecosystem is closed? Well, there's really no kind of ecosystem that's closed because what does that mean? Everything's in there and nothing can get out, but you can't keep things from getting out. You can put stuff in a bottle, but that bottle's gonna have heat being exchanged with the outside and therefore it's not a closed system we've talked about that a little bit before we talked about the second law of thermodynamics okay so what this kind of diagram shows is represented by a box is a whole bunch of organisms but unlike one that's coming up soon the size of the box doesn't represent anything here we're going to come back to a diagram where the size of the box represents a conceptual thing but right here we're kind of ignoring the size of the box because normally there would be more producers than there would be uh, primary consumers and more of these than there would be those. We'll come back to that later. Now we're going to focus on the arrows. We got red dotted ones and we got blue solid ones. Okay. Now it's pretty easy to figure out that the red dotted ones refer to energy, right? Because one of them is labeled energy right and then you know heat's a form of energy and so these represent energy being passed from one thing in this case it's source in the sun to a trophic level primary producers to the next level what's that mean these things are eating those things right 
and that arrow is represented in a food web, food chain. So it means much the same thing. Things are being passed from these organisms to those. What kind of things? Energy. And then what other kind of things? Chemicals. And of course, once we get past here, where the energy is radiant, the energy is also in the chemicals, in their bonds, until it gets released as this kind of energy, which is also radiant energy, right? That's the kind we call infrared. So what do you notice about the arrows? The red ones leave at certain places. They leave this system and go into the bigger system at large. They do not come back. This is what we emphasized before. Energy does not cycle through a system, but nutrients do. Nutrients all the way down to atoms, right? Talking about atoms like carbon, they get recycled. How do carbon atoms get back to here, right? That's when respiration in any kind of organism, including these guys, right, causes glucose carbons, for instance, to become carbon dioxide carbons. Then they can return to be reincorporated into organic molecules by photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. So this is all about that too. Photosynthesis and chemosynthesis has a lot to do with this diagram. Okay, so now some other words that are in the syllabus. We have saprotroph here. It's defined up here. A saprotroph is the kind of decomposer that instead of outright eating something that's dead, like an earthworm would, right? eating dead leaves and things. These secrete enzymes outside. This is what fungus does. This is what some animals do too. Let the digestion happen outside and then they slurp up, so to speak, or absorb the nutrients. That's a saprotroph compared to a detritivore. Detritus is a word somebody thought of for dead organic material like rotting leaves. Something that eats them directly is a detritivore but they both accomplish the same thing in terms of these food webs and things. They are decomposers. And the main ones, again, are fungi, kingdom, and the prokaryotes. Okay, explain how changes in free energy availability can result in disruptions to an ecosystem. What's that mean? Well, like, if the sun goes out, then we start having effects in the ecosystem, right? Free energy availability. Um, so a change in this producer level we already talked about is bottom-up kind of regulation. The dominoes are going to start to fall. Uh, so that's what this is all about. So if we go now in a little more specific, looking at this primary production thing, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about things like photosynthesis, but also like protein synthesis. We're talking about producing organic molecules being the first ones to do that, and that's what the autotrophs do, okay? What are the two biggest key factors? Well, certainly for photosynthesizers, it's going to be light, but on a large geographic scale, temperature and moisture are the key factors. We're going to add light to that too, which the next slide I think is, or coming up soon, right? Here we have a gross and net thing, kind of like with diffusion. We had net movement with diffusion. We have gross, we have net, right? So here's how it applies to primary production, right? Gross profits in a business are all the money you take in. So gross primary production would be all the light energy that's converted into chemical energy. But in order to do that, an autotroph has to stay alive. How does it do that? It recharges its ATPs in that process we call respiration. So this represents the cost of doing business, if we're back to a business. So if I make $1,000 in my business, gross profit 
but I had to spend $300 to make that, right? That was my cost. Then my net gain in this case would be $700. It's the same with energy, right? What does this number represent? What I made by photosynthesis. What does this number represent? What I had to spend to stay alive, I had to spend by respiration, and so my net gain had to take in the respiration effect. So there's a little practice one, right? So you've got three variables there, right? Net equals gross minus, you know, respiration minus cost. So they could give you any two of those and expect you to easily be able to figure out the third. So there you go. There's that. one. Okay. So this is all about um, productivity. Here you have a uh, percent of Earth's surface that these different ecosystems or biomes, if you want to call them whatever, cover. You can see the ocean covers so much of the Earth's surface that they had to break the line here in the graph to fit it on this little graph. But these numbers show how much of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean compared to these others. Okay, so I'm not going to help you read these because you can read graphs. Average net primary production, net primary productivity. Oh boy. Tropical rainforests are really good at that. But these are even better, right? These are the biggest two, but what's this in terms of? This is a key, meters squared. It's in terms of how much you're producing compared to the area you cover. That's why since ocean, uh, open oceans cover so much territory, even though their productivity level is low per meter squared, right? They produce the most organic molecules. And what are they in the open ocean? mostly algae, most of those kind of uh, pro protista kind of cells that we call algae. Okay, um, so where are we here? We're there. Okay, so radiation and temperature are closely linked, right, to primary production. Why? Because it's chemistry. Temperature is always important, right? But this is that kind of chemistry that involves light, so radiation is also important. And here we had another lesson that we learned the hard way. We humans making waste, making things that aren't waste, but they weren't intended to go into a lake. But when we put fertilizer on our lawn or a golf course and it rains, the runoff water uh, cycle we're talking here, the runoff puts it into lakes. What is this kind of stuff? This is food. If you're algae in those lakes, if you're at the bottom of the food chain, this is like, wow, it's dinner time, right? This might sound like a good thing. To increase the creatures at the bottom of the food chain might sound like a good thing. But like some good things, we've also had talked about DDT as a good side. We learned the hard way it might have a bad side. And this is a process called eutrophication, which started to occur, especially in small bodies of water, and showed the bad side okay about explaining that to us well i know this isn't too easy to read but there's steps here here's the nutrients that flow into the water fertilizer sewage this could even be like milk near a dairy spilled milk you know in large amounts in a dairy whatever the algae love it they feed they grow you might think well that's great because they're also the bottom of the food chain that should be good for all the little things that eat them, right? Primary consumers, more primary consumers, more secondary consumers. Oh, you know what? Algae, when they do photosynthesis, they also make oxygen. We should have lots of oxygen in this water too. Well, there's a downside to it. The more algae that grow, and growth here also means reproduce, the more algae that die. What do the dead ones do? They sink. What do they find at the bottom of this lake? They find bacteria who are now saying, yay, now it's our turn to enter the cafeteria. And we now have so much food, we can reproduce a whole lot. But what do we do when we reproduce? Well, same as these algae, when we reproduce, we also use oxygen. 
What's different about us than the algae? We're not making any oxygen. So this lake slowly starts to become oxygen deficient from the bottom up. And now this thing which seemed on the surface, literally on the surface, to be so good, more algae, more oxygen on the surface, now starts to work its way up and starts to kill those kind of things, especially the ones that are really um, uh, uh, sensitive to oxygen, like uh, trout, for instance, in a lake, really need well oxygenated water. And fish kills were the first kind of sign that something was going wrong. And then we put our scientific minds together and figured out what was going on, and we gave it a name called eutrophication. Here's an IB syllabus thing. This is a great example of this general kind of bullet that says a disturbance might influence the structure and rate of change within an ecosystem. Eutrophication is a great example of that disturbance. In this case, is a huge increase in nutrients, which affected the uh, bottom level of the food chain. So this is bottom up kind of regulation and started the dominoes falling that was not good for the whole system. Okay, so if you're a small body of water, as your water flows, oxygen from the atmosphere comes in and you get oxygenated, just like in a fish tank, you have a bubbler, that, that's why you have the bubbler in there. But this problem can be so big that in a large body of water, like the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of Oman, um, across the across the, the big pond there. Um, this has been uh, now understood to be a huge problem. Hypoxic means less oxygen, right? These big dead zones where not everything is dead, but whole bunches of sea life have died, just like in that little pond and for the same reason, right? Is a big thing in the Gulf of Mexico. New Orleans is right uh, over here somewhere. Um, because all this area in the United States, to look to this kind of small map, all this area is the watershed for the Mississippi River. That means all kinds of fertilizer and sewage and stuff like that is dumping into this one place at the end of the Mississippi River from about half the United States.